ご飯まだかけざる時いかん。ご飯まだかけざる時いかん。ご飯まだかけざる時いかん。ご飯まだかけざる時いかん。ご飯まだかけざる時いかん。ご飯まだかけざる時いかん。ご飯まだかけざる
I have considered shrinking a foot, but it hasn't worked out so well. Seems that the older one gets, one shrinks in height, but expands, expands in, in, in other directions. <laughs> and that's hard to reverse. Yeah, you are still, you are, you are still young enough to laugh about it. <laughs> but it's also the activity of Dharma. Yeah, so when I first looked at this corn and I misremembered what it is. I was thinking of the next one. So last night I was getting ready. Okay, let me write up the case so Inzi-san can post it. And I looked at it and I went, holy crap. <laughs> this is a completely different koan. I thought it was the next one. But sometimes that's how we are precipitously awakened to a rather inconvenient uh, truth. So we'll deal with it. We'll just go forward and do the best we can. And it's so interesting how even these encounters, how much richness they offer. They offer a richness because we see so many things suddenly. Yeah, yeah. And now it couldn't be any other corn today than this one. So let's look at it. The sail has yet to be hoisted. The first person we encounter here is Ganto Zenkatsu. Very interesting Zen master from the heyday of Zen in China, the Tang Dynasty. He appears in five cases in this Shumon Katoshu and he lived from 828 until 887. So he was born in a place that called, that's called Nanan in today's Guangxu province. Well, now today it's called Fujian, I think, yeah. His family name was Ke. He became, as many of the monks then, an, a novice, not in the Zen tradition, but in some scriptural, scriptorial studies or Vinaya studies. That type of Buddhism had arrived earlier to China. And we all know the work of the preced, uh, preceding generation when we chant any of the sutras that are in Kanji, because people like Kumar Rajiva tr transliterated or transposed them from the Sanskrit or the Pali, whichever it was into Chinese characters, sometimes by sound and sometimes by meaning. So that already shows that there was a very, very deep involvement between the Chinese culture and the Indian type of Buddhism. Now, of course, those who have PhDs in that area will probably be able to explain to us in more detail which sutras are actually considered to be original and which are like apoc apocryphal, so put together and so to, so, so to speak a pretense sutras or put together from other places uh, into one thing that is maybe didactically of a better composition than the big sutras where it came from. And the Wisdom Sutras, if I'm not mistaken, are considered to be put together that way, probably. Certainly the Diamond Sutra. I think there are versions that only have 16 of the chapters, but then suddenly later you find 32. And the Diamond Sutra is very interesting to begin with because when the caves at Dong Huan were, were opened, was where it was found in, in a time capsule. 
And it happens to be, I believe, the oldest printed extant document of humanity, the Diamond Sutra. There's a wonderful frontispiece there where you see the Buddha sitting and you can see Subhuti with his shoulder uncovered. This is our Chinese slash Japanese way of uncovering our shoulder is by covering the other one more. But it goes back to that. And when we hear the Diamond Sutra in the beginning, we heard the introduction. The Buddha sits down on a cloth after washing his feet. We still have this cloth, the zagu, that we spread when we bow, and we spread it so that this rope does not touch the floor. So there's a lot of real history that we find in the sutras, that we find transmigrate from India to China, from China to Japan, from Japan to here, from China to Korea, from Korea to America, even from China, because there's this, do you know there's another Rinzai lineage that we don't often speak about that goes through Vietnam? So Thich Nhat Hanh was a Rinzai monk. Of course, there are all kinds of different flavors and teachings that come according which route this type of practice to, to appear here in North America. So Ganto, he lived a little later than these translators, but he still, when he became a novice monk, he received the full precepts and he devoted himself to studying the scriptures particularly the Nirvana Sutra. And some people are very happy with that. But Ganto wanted to venture out and try one of the newer flavors of Buddhism. And so he became interested in Zen, in Chan. There was a master by the name of Daiji Kanchu, that's the Japanese pronunciation, which he first, uh, whose assembly he joined, and there he met two fellow monks, Seppo Gison, Seppo we all probably know from many stories, and Kinzan, who were training there. And together these three set off on a pilgrimage because they wanted to meet Rinzai. And as they were traveling, they met one of Rinzai's students who told them the sad news that Rinzai had already left this earth. But then Ganto became a student of Toksan, Toksan Senka. He was more, maybe one of the most brilliant students of Toksan. Many koans speak about the interactions between Toksan and Ganto. And most of the time, Ganto gets the last word. <laughs> so sometime after Ganto became Toksan's Dharma heir, times were not good for Buddhism. There was an emperor by the name of Wu Zong who did not like Buddhism. We would ask ourselves, why? Why? So here's a little uh, piece from an edict that this emperor put out. And it's really important that we understand it. Because at that time, Buddhism already has had become a really important part of the then life uh, Chinese culture of the religiosity and even of the buildings, the skyline had Buddhist temples in it. And so it's not surprising that these Tang emperors who were political figures, but also religious figures as part of being the sons of heaven, that they had some kind of ambivalent feelings against 
or about Buddhism, both as a religion and maybe even more so as a growing stream of assemblies, not only assemblies, but then temples. Temples mean real estate. Real estate means money. And even then, religious institutions did not provide any tax revenue to the emperor. So this kind of substantial wealth that was held by the Buddhist institutions showed that there, there is something to be concerned about for somebody who would like to collect taxes and stay in power. So this Emperor Wuzong was a fervent Taoist. And he listened to his Taoist advisors. He was still looking for this elixir of immortality. And he came closer and closer the more he was promised he listens to his Taoist advisors, who, of course, just wanted to stay in good graces, too. So here he, he is a little trans, a piece of the translation of this edict that he uh, formulated. Buddhism has spread to the hills and plains of all the nine provinces and through the walls of towers of our two capitals. Each day finds its monks and followers growing more numerous and its temples more lofty. It wears out the strength of the people with constructions of earth and wood. It pilfers their wealth for ornaments of gold and precious objects, causes men to abandon their lords and parents for the company of teachers and it severs man and wife with its monastic decrees. In destroying law and injuring mankind, indeed, nothing surpasses this doctrine. Now, if even one man fails to work the fields, someone must go hungry. If one woman does not tend her silkworms, someone will be cold. At present, there are an inestimable number of monks and nuns in the empire, each of them waiting for the farmers to feed them and the silkworms to close them, while the public temples and private chapels have reached boundless numbers, all with soaring towers and elegant ornamentation sufficient to outshine the imperial palace itself. I think today we would call this culture war. It all happened then. Just to stay in power, the same thing happens over and over again. So what did this edict actually do in the end? It dissolved all the monasteries. All the monks had to put down their robes, go back to the fields. It was forbidden to wear robes. This kesa could not be worn unless you wanted to be thrown in jail. And I don't think jail in the ninth century was a nice place to be. So, Ganto, was also lay-sized. And he worked as a ferryman, not far from where his monastery used to be. The ferryman is an interesting picture. Now, while I pick up this water, maybe you can remember, is there some kind of a story, some kind of an Indian novel, that features a fairy man. Siddhartha. Oh, you gave it away. <laughs> but there are extra points if you find his name. Now you up, you you, you up the ante. So, <laughs> what is the name of the fairy man 
in Siddhartha who listens to the river. Vasudeva, Vasudeva, the ferryman. And of course, it's written by Hermann Hesse. Again, I'm repeating myself, but it's an interesting, not coincidence, but connection. Siddhartha, in the original German, it's called Eine Indische Dichtung, an Indian. It's not novel, but it's not a poem, but literary work. And it has two parts. And the second part actually has a dedication to one specific person. And it says there, dedicated to my cousin in Japan. And that cousin's name was, no, was it Heinrich. I think his first name was Heinrich Gundert, who turned into a sinologist and Japanologist and was the first one to translate the Heiki Ganroku, the Bien Lu, the Blue Cliff record into a Western language. He was the cousin of Hermann Hesse. Very interesting. So, Ganto served as a ferryman, and there's a lot to, to that because we are talking about nautical things today, yeah? So during the time, you know, in the final years of the Tang dynasty, dynasty when the assembly dispersed, they weren't allowed to wear ropes anymore. So they came up with one really sneaky thing. They made it small. They made it so small that one could wear it under regular clothes. And that is the origin of, yeah, of the Rakusu. It was worn under. Nowadays, we wear it outside. And even that is a reminder that it wasn't always taken for granted that we could practice this kind of a practice. It was not possible in the last years of this Tang dynasty. And even in Japan, if you think of the Kishaku Haibutsu with the persecution of Buddhism, it's not so esoteric that Tore Enji says, if they should turn against us and abuse and persecute us. There are many stories about that. So Ganto also was laicized and the other monks went away and he was just tending the temple by himself. And what happened one day? Bandits came. Now, of course, you can be sure that the emperor did not leave anything behind that would have any value. So everything was taken from that empty monastery or the skeleton of an empty monastery. And there was Ganto still there. But they didn't find anything, the bandits. So they got very upset. And Ganto remained calm. But they came, where's the stuff? And he couldn't provide anything. So. What better to do than stab him? They stabbed Ganto, and it is said that he remained calm, but he gave a great shout that resounded for a distance of 10 li. It could be heard through the universe. Many, many years later, the story of this shout also relates to our tradition here, the Hakuin tradition. Because Hakuin Ekaku, he studied Zen, he studied Buddhism, but he came to this point of impasse when he was not too old with this story of 
questioning himself. So here we have somebody who is as accomplished as Ganto Zenkatsu. And he gets stabbed by Buddhists. Oh, no, no. Oh. <laughs> by, by bandits. Maybe we're Buddhist bandits. <laughs> he gets stabbed and he dies. What is this Buddhist thing good for if it doesn't even save Ganto? And Hakuin said, well, I had it with this. And he took some time off. He took some time off Buddhism. So that's the first guy who appears here. And he's asked by a monk, how about when the old sail has yet to be hoisted? We don't know who the monk is, but we certainly can say that this language here is somewhat pictorial. It's a metaphor for something. The old sail has yet to be hoisted. When you study the characters that are used sometimes, and I just, we just spoke about that before we came in here, I asked Inji-san, who is very knowledgeable because she knows Chinese very well. I asked, isn't there something nautical in the Han from Hanya? Yeah, one side of the character is the character for boat, boat. And he is sailing boat, ferryman. So you get this kind of motion on the water. When the ocean is too deep, you can't do what the ferryman or a ferry person does. Maybe there were ferry women too. You can't touch the ground and push the ferry over to the other side, like on a river. And even some rivers are too deep to do that. So there has to be some kind of other way of locomotion, of forward movement. In Zen practice, this and in Buddhism, this is an interesting kind of proposition because what do you use boats for? Get to the other side. To get to the other side, right. To get to the other side. Gate, gate, para gate, para sam gate. Over, over to the other shore. And one way to do this is sailing. So what could it really, what could it mean? How about when this old sail has yet to be hoisted? First of all, we can see here that there is an old sail. It is nothing new. It's not somebody inventing a sail. Oh, well, look at this. I invented the sail. And we don't have to reinvent it. It has to be hoisted. In that already, we learn about something else, not just the sail, but A sail is no good without wind. It's also not good without some kind of a pole or a mast to be hoisted or to be held up with. All these parts of the image are very descriptive of our practice, you know? There is the need for something that is invisible. When did you see the wind? Last. You can't probably see the wind. We can see the effects of the wind. The wind in the trees when they sway, or the leaves that are being blown around, but it's, we can't see the wind. There is a need for something that is stable, like the boat with the mast, to which we apply something that is 
movable that can catch the wind. Now, if we use that for looking at our practice, we could easily say, well, the vessel we are born into, maybe that is our vessel, our ship. Vessel is an interesting word in English because it means number one vessel. It's something that contains something, yeah. But it's also something that moves something. Very, very interesting. That's not the case in German, yeah. There's a difference between a container and a ship. Well, they're container ships, but <laughs> they're neither this nor that. So vessel is a wonderful part of this. How about when the old sail has yet to be hoisted? Let me give you a couple of very short lines from the collection of capping phrases, the Jakugo the little parts from many literary works or koans that are used in, in Zazen practice and probably in other lin lineages to serve as responses to koans. So here, for example, Kaze o karite ho ho ago. Raise a sail to catch. That's what we're doing when we sit in Zazen. We calm down and we learn how to become susceptible to that what we cannot see, to that we, that brings us all these phenomena, like the wind we can't see, but the phenomena are there. And we learn to go with it. More than that, actually, we also have to learn how to steer. Kaze o mite, ho o tsukau. Watch the wind to handle the sail. Another of these phrases. And all too often, maybe we find ourselves that we, we feel, well, everything is moving around me. Everything. And I am the center of the universe. There's a two-part Jakugo uh, here that speaks about that. Mizo o kunde wa yama no ugoku ka to utagai. Ho o agete wa kishi no yuku ka to oboyu. When you draw water, you wonder if the mountains are moving. The reflection of the mountains in the water when you draw. The mountains are moving. When you hoist the sail, you think the cliffs are gliding by. pointer, what is moving? How about when the old sail has yet to be hoisted? The traditional orthodox interpretation of that is how about when awakening has not happened? When a person is still not awake, and in the question again, old sail, it is there already. So it's not anything new. Then the answer, Ganto gives, a small fish swallows a big fish. How often does that happen? That the small fish eat the big fish? Almost never. Almost never. Certainly not for one small fish, yeah? Many, many small fish. Maybe if we turn into piranhas, we can eat a big fish. But usually that doesn't happen. 
So the orthodox elucidation of this answer is, well, how about if, some, if somebody is not yet opened their Dharma eye, it seems like something that everything seems it is something unlikely, right? We think it's something mysterious. It's the time when the small fish swallows the big fish. Mysterious. The monk continued, how about after it's been hoisted? What if somebody has awakened? A donkey grazes in the back garden. That's what Ganto said. Again, our orthodox teaching here would say, mm, it's the most natural of all things. The donkey just eats where the grass is. So that's the first half of it. The second half featuring Kido, Chigo, and Nampo Jomyo, who we will talk about soon, has the same structure. How about when the old sail has yet to be hoisted? Says Kido. Nampo, who is the student, replies, five Mount Sumerus in the eye of a net. What is Mount Sumeru? Hmm? Is, is it a real mountain? No. Is it big? Yes. <laughs> now this almost, almost sounds like a checking question to a koan after your response. The question would be, how big is Mount Sumeru? <laughs> and if you come back with an answer that says, according to the Indian teaching, Mount Sumeru stretches 84,000 yojana below the sea, 84,000 yojana above it, and one yojana is five miles. So it's 420,000 miles high <laughs> and 420,000 miles wide. And on the top resides the god Indra. And that is the ay, 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 Triya Strimsha heaven, the realm of the Devas, which we spoke about two days ago. Four heavenly kings live on the sides of Mount Sumeru. And the mountain is surrounded by seven concentric golden mountain ranges, each separated by a sea of fresh water. Beyond that is another ocean containing four continents. Purvavedia, Aparugodania, Uttarakuru, and, and Jambu Dvipa in the east, west, north, and south. Surrounding the entirety are two ranges of iron mountains. Now, in the Hindu cosmology, the inhabitants of that heaven they are each half a crochet tall that comes to about 1,500 feet. And they live for 1,000 of their years. And each day of their years in their year is equivalent to 100 years in our world. That is for a total of 36 million years. It's interesting to really appreciate the Indian way of expressing the uncountable, the immeasurable. And we hear it, well, Subhuti, are the grains of sands of the river Ganges many? Yes, well done and what? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, one of one. There are many, but they're not even enough. If there were as many Ganges rivers as sands of grains in the Ganges, would those be many? So really what I appreciate about that is it is the physicality that gives us this kind of dimension that we cannot comprehend. 
So now in the eye of that net, there are five of these mounts and arrows, not just one. Again, it's something that is inconceivable. If we are not awakened, says the Orthodox teaching, you wonder about it in the same way. It's as mysterious as finding five universes within the eye of a net. Kido continued, how about after it's been hoisted? So once an awakening happened, Nampo replied, the yellow river flows north. It just flows again in the same way that the horse, the donkey ate in the backyard, the yellow river flows north. The donkey made me laugh today, Takako-san. It made me laugh today, the donkey, because donkey, Usagi Uma, I looked it up. Usagi Uma, it said in the dictionary for donkey. You know what Usagi is? It's a, a rabbit. And Uma is horse. <laughs> so a donkey is a rabbit horse because it has rabbit ears. <laughs> Takako-san is a puzzle. <laughs> so maybe I looked at the wrong dictionary. <laughs> yeah, Usagi Uma. <laughs> so that's the orthodox, the orthodox way of looking at this. But there's also another way of looking at this. What the old sail. What if there is nothing that catches on to anything before the sail rises, before there is any movement, before there is wind and sail? What about that? The word state is not a appropriate word. What about the event in which there is no sail, no ship, no wind? That place that we experience in Zazen at times when everything drops away, when no time, no space, no self is perceived. Is that something that is, has happened to you? Is it something extraordinary? Maybe we think so, but did anyone really sleep well last night without any dreams? When we sleep and there's no dreams, when there's no time, when there's no space, that is not unlike what we experience in Zazen at this point of the smallest, smallest, the contraction that can't contract anymore because everything's Goksho no Jotai, the place of the smallest, 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 smallest. And it is not a state, it's an event. Joshu Roshi, my ordination teacher, used to say, even in that place, a faint breeze blows. It can't be seen either, but there is still movement. How do we know that? More than that, we are actually awake. We all woke up to various degrees this morning. <laughs> and that shows there, even in that event, there is still some underlying motility, motion, dynamic element. 
So the answer that Ganto gives here, a small fish swallows a big fish. Is that possible when there are no small fishes, no big fish, no fish? So transcending small and big, transcending huge mountains like Mount Sumeru and eyes of minuscule insects. All of that doesn't matter in that state. That's the second interpretation. However, what is it if we call the sail the self? What if there is no self? If there is no self, there is no subject and object. If there is no subject and object, there's another word for that kind of experience that doesn't have the separation. Non-duality, not to. So as long as there is not two, small fish swallow big fish. Because there is no small, there is no big. It doesn't mean that there are not small fish and that it doesn't mean that, there are, that small fish and big fish can't be there, yeah? Non-duality is difficult to understand if you just think about it. So let me give you one example that I have taken to using lately. Non-duality doesn't mean there isn't big and small or there is not darkness and light. Non-duality only means that when it's light, it's light. When it's dark, it's dark. Duality comes into existence in the moment when it's light and we conceive of darkness. Oh, I don't like the light. It's too bright. Or when it's dark and we start to, oh, I want it to be light. So if there's no small fish and no big fish, what is left? Fish. <laughs> what is left? Fish is a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Only the swallow is left. Only suchness. What, what, when the self arises, when the sail has been hoisted, when there is subject and object, then the sail catches the wind. Our self comes into existence. And we move through this world. We call it being alive. And it is a world where there is wind, where there is a sail to be hoisted, where there are rabbits and horses and rabbit horses and donkeys and most certainly plenty of asses. <laughs> Kido and Nampo, let me just speak about them a little bit. Kido Chigo is the Japanese name for a Chinese Zen ancestor of ours, who was the teacher of Nampo Jomyo, who was a Japanese person who came to China to study. Nampo Jomyo was much later, of course, than Kanto. He was in the 13th century. 1235 until 1309 still appears in two cases in the Shuma Katoshu. He was a native of Abe in Suruga 
in the present Shizuoka Ken, so Shizuoka province. His family name was Fujiwara. He became a monk at 15 and began Zen training at 18 at Kenchoji in Kamakura, which is in the Kanagawa prefecture. His first Chinese master, Japanese name is Rankei Doryu, who was the founder of Kenchoji. But he decided to go back to the motherland of China and to study under Kido Chigo. So when we chant tonight, you will notice that Jikijitsu-san plays the inkin at specific points in the chant. The first inkin comes with Shakyamuni. Before there are the other Buddhas and with Shakyamuni, that Buddha land ends. Then we have 28 generations of Indian, subcontinental Indian ancestors. And the last one is Hanyatara Sonja. Then comes Bodhidharma, who came from India and went to China. So he is number 28, but he's also number one in the Chinese count. And then there are 28 in China. And the last one, where we have a bell again, is Kido Chigo. The first one in Japan is Nampo Jomyo. So he studied then under Kido Chigo, became a successor and returned to Kamakura. He continued to practice at Kenchoji and was called to Kyoto, became the abbot of Manjuji, and so on, but he ended up actually being uh, the abbot of Kenchoji, so his teacher's temple in Kamakura. When he died in 1309, after he died, he became a national teacher, so that is the highest honor when the emperor gives you a specific name. And his name was national teacher Enzo Daio. Enzo Daio Kokushi. Mostly nowadays he's called Dai O Kokushi. His successor was Shuho Miocho. Shuho Miocho, Dai To Kokushi. And then the next one in the lineage is Kanzan Egen, the founder of Miyoshinji. So this lineage of these three people together is called the O To Kan lineage, Dai O Kokushi, Dai To Kokushi, and Kanzan again. Every Japanese derived Dharma lineage nowadays comes from that root. So, going back to the ship, We are on this ocean of samsara that sports lots of waves, not only fish, but some really scary creatures that are waiting for us, to, that want to swallow us. Sometimes they do, and they spit us out again, sometimes chewed up, sometimes not. and learning on the cushion as our vessel, how to navigate the currents of our own, let's say karmic tides, not only tides, but also streams, like the Gulf Stream in the ocean, the currents, that exist in this ocean of conditions from which we arise and from which we think we, think we are separate. In Zazen, we can learn how to hoist the sail and 
get ourselves out of that current that has just bringing us back and back to the same place. And we know, oh yeah, I know, next is the rocks. <laughs> Hoisting that sail of becoming flexible enough to catch the wind. If we are too stiff, the boat will fall over, the wind will blow it over. So learning how much to sail put out, how to steer, not to hold the tiller too tightly, not to let it go, is part of what we do here on the cushion. And we do it together. I hope that we will emerge from this session as ships that have crossed ways on this ocean, but not ships in the night that sail by each other without noticing each other's presence, without acknowledging our similarity, our connection and our journey. To end this, I want to just remind, here we go, bring up again a quote of uh, a Zen monk who we, Shukusan and I met at Mount Bali by the name of Jikan. And the Zen monk said in his other role as a poet, you have to become the ocean or you will be seasick every day. So let's all sail together in this wind of Dharma.